Good morning, everyone. Uh, today we, we will <coughs> comment and discuss on, on the paper Behavior, Purpose, and Theology, which is 1943 classic by Arturo Rosenbluth, Norbert Wiener, and Julian Bigelow. Um, on Tuesday, we spoke already uh, uh, about the relationship between Arturo Rosenbluth and Norbert Wiener and how, let's say, they met in Boston and they collaborated and uh, let's say, so, some might say that this paper kind of set some of the basis for, for cybernetics. And uh, a bit of, <coughs> of the context of, of this paper, until that time, it was uh, taboo to speak about purpose in science um, because, um, I mean, since Galileo, uh, there, there had been a deep division and conflict between science and religion. And since religion uh, spoke about purpose, um, some scientists assumed that if you spoke about purpose, then you were religious and you shouldn't do that because scientific science tried to be objective and purpose was objective. And of course, Aristotle speaks about different types of causes. Um, yeah, there's the final cause and the, <coughs> I, I forget the whole classification of the different types of cause. Um, so in that context, you could say that the purpose of, let's say, humans or uh, animals or, or machines uh, let's say, can be spoken about, even from a more philosophical perspective rather than a scientific perspective. Um, the time, let's say, first half of the 20th century, is, it was still considered that um, by some, that uh, purpose of man, yes, uh, because they, they used the sexist, uh, terminology. Uh, I mean, speaking about all humans, um, of course, that the purpose was given by God. And, um, and then, of course, it was problematic to have a scientific uh, study of, of purpose. And well, the theology, actually, it's the study of purpose. Um, and what the authors do in this paper is to <coughs> propose, uh, let's say, not necessarily objective, because of course you need an observer to, to describe system and let's say to, to define the system, but let's say trying to take the mysticism out of uh, out of purpose. Uh, <coughs> and it's interesting because. Um, this led, on the one hand, to to the study of systems independently of their substrate, which is one of the characteristics of cybernetics and also of complex system science. <clears throat> and so, um, let's say when we speak about in cybernetics about the purpose of a system, we are not really interested about what makes that system, what are its components, but we are speaking at a more abstract level, and. Um, so, so in that sense, we can also speak about purpose in machines. We can also speak about purpose in societies. Um, and, and it's just a, a way of describing phenomena. It doesn't mean that uh, we should enter a discussion about how real purpose is in bacterium or in a state or, I, I don't know, in, in, in a rock or something, no? We could say that the goal of rocks is to minimize their uh, their, their um, kinetic energy. So that kind of makes them fall um, and roll. So we could say that, but it's not perhaps very useful to, to describe rocks as purposeful. But we could do it if, if we wanted. I mean, it's not that it's wrong, it's just that it might not be useful. 
so in, in this context, <coughs> um, I mean, since you all read the paper with a little, let's say, repeat what there is uh, in the paper, but I, I would like to, to comment on, on what you found interesting, uh, especially considering that it was written, um, well, it was almost 80 years ago. Yeah. So in the next year it will be 80, 80 years. Um, so yeah, the, today's class is meant to be more interactive. So I'm uh, I'm listening to to your ideas and opinions. Can be repeating what what you already uploaded as your homework. You can also say it in Spanish if it's complicated in English. Yeah, yes, Shoichin. Hi. Um, I admit that I've just proofread it. I still have to uh, write the, <laughs> the, the text. Uh, so I have some questions about the meaning itself of some of the concepts that are defined in the paper. Yes. So um, I understood the classification that the author makes at the beginning. So it's very clear and it's, it also refers to many concepts that uh, maybe are underlying sometimes in the uh, scientific procedures of many hard sciences. So it's, it's in, yes. in informatics, in physics, in mathematics, oftentimes these concepts come up really not explicitly, but you know, it, it can be traced back. But I had a question about, uh, I was, it was a bit unclear to me, um, the last part of the discussion about the teleology and how it is uh, related or unrelated to, um, to determinism. And I, I really did not see, I'm not able to understand what are the differences in these uh, but probably this is very important, so I wanted to ask a little bit of a clarification about this this uh, distinction that the author makes about these concepts, teleology and uh, determinism. Yeah, <clears throat> well, according to their classification, a non-purposeful behavior is random, uh, and I, I think they give the example of a roulette and. Um, so following that, if it's deterministic, then it should have purpose, <laughs> which might seem strange uh, to, to draw that boundary. Like, okay, if it's deterministic, it, it's purposeful. And if, if it's random, then it doesn't have a purpose uh, because I'm sure we can think of examples that contradict it in both ways, meaning that you can add some randomness to a system that still has a purpose, but in spite of that randomness or thanks to that randomness, it manages to reach its goals. And um, and on the other hand, we could also think about deterministic systems that say would not be easily described as purposeful. Well, of course, they, they, they're speaking about active um, behavior, no? because if, if it's like a passive system, like a rock, then let's say that doesn't even enter into the discussion. Um, but yeah, could, could you think of an example of an active deterministic system that might not be purposeful? By active, let's understand that it has the dynamics. Uh, 
uh, Amari writes, evolution is a good example where we can find randomness and purpose, in this case, adaptation and optimization. Uh, that's a whole discussion whether evolution has a purpose or not. <laughs> um, because, of course, you can observe tendencies in evolution. Like, for example, there has been an increase in complexity in, in evolution in our planet. But does that mean that the purpose of evolution is to produce more complex organisms and systems and to have metasystem transitions? Um, that's more difficult to, to argue for. Um, so I, I think the, precisely the, the big idea of Darwin is that you can explain evolution without purpose, let's say with random variation. Um, yeah, yeah, Sophia? Um, I wanted to add something about this topic because I felt a bit weird as a physicist um, reading about purpose and everything because I've always been taught that um, some phenomena occur in such a way or um, I mean everything occurs in a way as to maximize entropy that was my way of thinking and adding a purpose into something I, I would think that biological systems are the same way because they are made of particles. <laughs> and so uh, this thing that it, it sounded to me like biologists say that thing, living things, living organisms have some uh, kind of will to live. And so I, I know several physicists don't like this uh, idea because it's, it's like humanizing every living organism. So I- Anthropomorphizing you. I, I was I disagreed a bit a bit with the with the the paper, and but I wanted to add this that maybe we we have to distance ourselves from the meaning of purpose in which we use it in the day to day life and rather uh, talk about purpose in a way that's like uh, a goal that unconscious goal of maybe maybe maximizing entropy I don't know. Thank you. Yeah, that that's another discussion because let's say the increase of entropy in thermo closed thermodynamic systems, it's one tendency of the universe, but biological systems don't tend to that in the uh, at scales at which we observe them. If we kind of increase the scale, then we can say, well, yeah, when the sun burns out, then the entropy will increase, but let's say yeah. for a few million years, entropy in our planet has not decreased. And this is not against the second law of thermodynamics because uh, it's an open system and we have been exploiting energy from the sun and from chemical sources and and so on. Mm -hmm. uh, so I, I thought about the example of forests and how forests are very efficient in, um, in uh, how do you say that? Um, they take energy from the sun and then they dissipate this energy and they're more efficient doing that than any other thing they do. And so, so I, I can think of other examples of biological systems that do yeah. that. No? Like they... Um, when animals eat some fruit or something, they go and disperse the seeds someplace else as to create more diversity in the system. I don't know. <laughs> yeah, just sorry. Yeah, yeah. I mean, not only living systems, or well, perhaps living systems. Perhaps um, you you know about the Gaia hypothesis by Lovelock yeah. and. Uh, so, so the argument is that we, we could speak about our planet as living because it self-regulates uh, its temperature and many other properties. And uh, there's a very simple computational model called Daisy World, where let's say you have a bit like the game of life as automaton with daisies, and they can be black or, or white. Actually, in NetLogo, there's uh, a, a daisy world model, so you can play with it. And uh, th there's a feedback mechanism. And 
within some ranges, let's say you assume that there's a, a star that lights the, the planet. And if you vary that the intensity of the light, then within certain range, um, the planet manages to maintain homeostasis, basically uh, maintains the same temperature, even when the uh, radiation from the star uh, varies, the ratio between dark daisies and white daisies, the, the dark ones absorb radiation, so they are preferred when, um, when, when there's less radiation. And the white ones, they reflect more radiation, so they're preferred when there's more radiation. Uh, and like that, they can reach a balance within a certain bound, but then if it increases too much, then they all die. <laughs> And also, if if uh, there's too few radiation, they will also die. Um, but I mean, living systems do that. But then we have built many artificial systems that also have homeostatic abilities. And then the question is whether we want to call those artificial systems living or not. And uh, in some contexts, we might want to call them that way, and in some others. Perhaps not, and um, I mean, for, for some it might be, um, let's say, I, I wouldn't say shocking, but let's say disturbing <laughs> that they speak, for example, about voluntary activity. Uh, but for example, Schopenhauer uh, already in the which year was it? Uh, early early nineteenth century. Schopenhauer, he published a book, The World as Will and Representation. So he, let's say, in order to describe the will of humans, uh, he says, well, everything has a will. And uh, our will is more sophisticated than that of animals or rocks, but they also have the will. So is the will of the rock to fall? <laughs> uh, and it might sound that it's not very useful, but the thing is that uh, if if you kind of have a gradual definition of will in this case, uh, then you don't run into the problem of trying to define when will begins. Uh, and and this might be uh, uh, well with purpose that that's the same, but you you face the same dilemma with life, with agency, with uh, mind or intelligence, with consciousness, uh, where do you draw the boundary? So we assume that uh, throughout the evolution of the universe, let's say we began just with atoms and molecules, and then they became more complex, and then there was life, and <laughs> life became more and more complex. So at, at which point you say, okay, now there is consciousness, for example, or purpose or will. And um, the attempts that try to kind of have a sharp distinction between, let's say, the non-living and the living, or the con conscious and the non-conscious, um, are problematic because you will always find examples that are somewhere in between. So that, that's a problem with definitions of life. Like you, you might say, oh, um, in, like in, in elementary school, in bio, I mean, we are taught uh, the so-called supermarket list definitions of, of biological systems. So basically, they say a living system is that which uh, grows and has a metabolism and reproduces and uh, I don't know, uh, a list of properties of living systems. Then you can find lots of examples of living systems that don't have all of those properties. So, um, the classical example is mules. They don't reproduce, but they are alive. Uh, I mean, they're not fertile. But then there are also other examples, for example, um, I forgot the name of, of this frog species that they, they live in, in Alaska that they enter cryptobiosis. So basically in winter, they freeze over. They have um, antifreeze fluid in their, in their blood so that 
no crystals are formed when they get frozen in the winter. Uh, so if you kind of check them out when they're frozen, you will say they're not alive because they don't have a metabolism. They're not doing anything. <laughs> um, but then they, in the spring comes, they melt and they become alive again. So, or, uh, and, um, uh, water bears, um, what's the proper name of, of water bears? These microscopic eight-legged creatures that can survive in extreme environments. But they also enter cryptobiosis and also some ticks. Uh, they live in the forest and they feed <laughs> themselves on bacteria that fall from the air. That would be great. Thanks. Um, <clears throat> so they, they can be like dormant for very long time and once they smell blood <laughs> they wake up like full from the depths and and they become active so yeah, yeah I, I mean it's, it's difficult to to have these definitions uh sh sharp ones so an alternative approach is to have like a gradual definition but of course this will give you other problems uh so you, you might have heard about panpsychism so there's the, the the idea that <clears throat> everything has a certain degree of consciousness or awareness uh and it's a let's say gradually increases and uh let's say humans have a high level of consciousness sometimes <laughs> uh yeah Okay, in the chat, there's lots of activity. So let me go back. So Lucrecia writes, it's not, en not entirely clear to me why the teleology in the outline of the article only considers negative feedback. Why does the purpose only depend on the goal? It seems to me that in this way, they're not considered spontaneous or purposeless situations <clears throat> that can greatly modify the behavior of the object are not considered and its environment are not considered. <clears throat> yeah, yeah, I mean, in the classification, well, I have the paper, so somewhere here <laughs> in, in the diagram, I think it's the only diagram. Um, so the first division is active and passive um, behavior. So there will be, yeah, the, 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 the passive uh, behavior will be non-purposeful according to, to their classification. And uh, it's, it's interesting that they have this kind of three uh, subdivision, but they only follow one branch because you could say, well, okay, from non-purposeful non random behavior, perhaps you could also have feedback. And what about that? <laughs> uh, and, and they don't go into that. But um, the, well, also, I wanted to mention that it is good to be critical with, with these papers, but also to be aware that in some cases, relevant papers are not those that kind of give solutions, but those that pose questions. Uh, when I was studying philosophy, one of our teachers would say that if you ask different philosophers, what, which are your two favorite philosophers and some people would say well plato and aristotle or plato and hegel or plato and wittgenstein or plato and another one but always plato was one of those two uh, and why not because plato made great answers to the questions and probably all of the answers of plato turned out to be wrong but he was the one who kind of systematized the questions and like after Plato, the rest of philosophy has been <laughs> dealing with those questions that he kind of managed to frame properly. Um, so in some cases you can say that half of the work or the difficult part of the work is framing the right question. And then sometimes it's easier to answer a right really posed question rather than uh, trying to answer something that is not properly asked. Like, uh, I mean, we might say that questions related to consciousness are ill-posed because 
of many things. Uh, I mean, that have to do with definition of consciousness. So if we can come up with a better question for addressing phenomena that we consider conscious, then that might be more relevant than all the attempts that have been made to answer ill posed questions. So <clears throat> in a similar way, the relevance of this paper might not be necessarily in their proposal, say the either solution, let's call it that way, um, on their definition of purposeful behavior, because as I will see, there are lots of exceptions to their definitions and you can say, oh, but what about this and what about that? Uh, but they, they were the first ones who tried to address this from a scientific perspective. And this was continued in cybernetics and it's still continued now. So, so I think that's the relevance and we should look at it uh, with this perspective. And of course, not just to say, ah, okay, so then we shouldn't criticize it. No, it's, it's good to criticize it, but to have in mind also that they were the first ones that were uh, dealing with this type of uh, narrative. So, of course, the, most probably they were, if you are the first one to speak about something or to speak about something in a certain way, most probably you will make mistakes because, uh, let's say, there hasn't been enough discussion in a community going on to, to find all the possible loopholes that in, in arguments and so on. Um, and, and that comes with time. So, so of course, the ideas that were presented here have been refined tremendously in, in the decades since. <laughs> so Mary shared a paper about this topic, solution and origin of life from the perspective of learning. Some interesting analogies between statistical physics and genetics. Okay. Uh, any other comment or question on the paper? <laughs> Sexist language. <laughs> okay, le let me try one comment. Somehow I, sure. I not so somehow I noticed like what they were trying to do at that time. It was to re to change the. Um, the definition of teleology that it was important in in evolutionary biology, and trying to put together what is what is similar between man-made machines, robots, and life beings, right? Like uh, biological entities. And but the, about the purpose and the teleology in the old fashion, every machine, every robot can be thought as teleological. We create the machines to do something. The Roomba is created to clean the the dust. I yes. think what they want to do from the point of view of the cybernetics is like to put like, what happens if we create a robot or a device that actually, let's call it a ball for start learning new things. And it, it does activities that nobody asks us to, to do, what we call today uh, general intelligence and stuff like that. In that way, they refurbish the concept of purpose to mean something different, that is function. At the end, every part of every robot, every machine, or every biological being has something that is not in the non-living realm, in the rocks, that is function. At the end, the photosynthesis that uh, Sonia mentioned before exists, and it has a function, collect light and make uh, sugars or whatever. In the grand scheme of things, the tree have also a function. It cleans the air, makes better space. This is what you mentioned about Gaia. But evolution is not teleological. Evolution is not an entity that says, you three, you have to do that. Simply select things back and forth. And I think Rosenbluth had this uh, vision of one day we will have machines that also will be responsive. And maybe together what they put in this purpose is the idea of function plus responsiveness. So more and more uh, in, in his hierarchy that, that you just mentioned, not the tree, in that hierarchy, every level resembled way more to a human cognition or something like that. And he explained with the, with the cat example, you need to have 
not just one sensing method, you need many sensing, you need control, you need more feedback, you increase in complexity. They never mentioned, but somehow it's like you increase in, in complexity. All this reusing the word purpose and teleology to give a totally different meaning, right? Yes, yes, uh, I, I agree. And um, we, we should also remember that 1943 was before the first general purpose digital computers were built. It was still during the war, uh, but still the bases were there. Uh, Alan Turing's paper where he proposed the Turing test, uh, let's say how to decide whether a machine can be intelligent or not was 1950. And the coinage of the artificial intelligence field was 1956. So um, let's say in, in this paper it's not explicit, but the seed is already there that if you have a robot that behaves like a dog and looks like a dog, and th then you can say, well, yeah, it's an artificial dog. And, and many people say, no, no, it's made of metal. It, it doesn't reproduce and the quacks are monotonous or whatever. Uh, you, you can uh, find ways in which it will be different. But for cybernetics, that was, the, I mean, uh, the goal of cybernetics was not to build dogs that were exactly like dogs because then, well, <laughs> what can you learn from that? Uh, but to build machines that have the properties of living systems or other systems. Um, and, and this would help uh, understand the natural systems and create new functionality in, in artificial systems. And this tradition has continued within artificial intelligence, not so much in, in classical artificial intelligence, but in, um, in the 1980s, let's say there was the, the field of behavior-based systems a bit opposed to, to well, in the 1980s, there were very, uh, different oppositions to classical artificial intelligence. There was connectionism, basically neural networks, which were also proposed in the 1940s and developed in the 1950s by Rosenblatt, but then he died and no one picked up on his work. Then they kind of uh, went dormant and in the 1980s, with back propagation algorithm and hopefully networks and so on, they kind of became popular again. And then in the 90s, they kind of enter an, another dormant phase and now they're popular again. But um, so, so there was connectionism, there was behavior-based systems and there was artificial life uh, that from different angles, they were opposing the classical artificial intelligence that tried to have a top-down control in order to achieve, as, as you mentioned, uh, general artificial intelligence, which uh, seems to be a very far away because, I mean, we, we can ask what is precisely the difference of an artificial system or uh, with a natural system or a living system. And from a cybernetic perspective, there wouldn't be such a difference because functionally you can describe them in the same way. Uh, so you, could, you can say also that the artificial system is a model of of the biological system so the, the, there's no argument that they are the same uh, but still all the uh, advancements in artificial intelligence even when they are impressive they're not general i mean they're all for specific tasks so yes it's amazing that they can beat humans in go and chess and driving and, and uh, jeopardy and, and so on. But um, uh, algorithms that are able to drive cars autonomously are not good for driving motorcycles autonomously, for example. You need to build a new one. And even when, for example, Alpha Zero, uh, let's say they say, oh, it learned from scratch the rules of the game. We, we didn't put anything in there. And it learned uh, shoji and chess and checkers or, or go, I forget. Well, the different board games. Uh, but all of these are what Simon Sinek calls finite games, meaning that you have a beginning and set rules and an end and a goal. <laughs> uh, and then you can easily evaluate success. 
so you can use that as um, to, to train uh, the, the artificial system. Uh, and in the real world, we are faced more often with infinite games, uh, like a company, um, like a romantic relationship. Um, I mean, what is the goal <laughs> of a company? Uh, if, if you have a finite game mentality, you will say, okay, the goal is to, I don't know, reach our sales, uh, to increase our sales by whatever percent this quarter. Uh, but if you look at it in the long term, the, the goal or the, yeah, the, the goal of companies is just to survive. <laughs> Uh, or better said, to keep on playing. That, that's the goal of the game. But there are no strict rules. I mean, business is always changing and social relations are always changing. Uh, so you cannot say, okay, I won uh, in a relationship. <laughs> and if, if, if you're married, then you, you know what I'm speaking about. <laughs> uh, because it's ongoing. Uh, <clears throat> And, and let's say the goal of the game is to keep on playing. Uh, so it's, it's not that there is no goal, it's just that the goal is not well-defined. And we haven't found a way of either translating this into a formal system or simply the limits of formal systems that have to do with uh, ghetto theorems and uh, let's say incompleteness and uh, inconsistency and also what Turing showed and church of uh, non-decidable. I, I don't know whether, let's say, these same limits are what doesn't allow artificial intelligence to overcome, uh, the, let's say, the special purpose domain. Because you, you can say, using the same argument from cybernetics, well, you just need more detail and um, and then you will be able to uh, you, you will be able to to program something that uh, is as general as a human because we can also say that we are more general than machines but we are not completely general in the sense that we have also our limits and even when we are very adaptable, we adapt within certain bounds. I mean, we cannot change our hardware, <laughs> just like machines cannot change our hardware. Um, but we are much more flexible. But then you could say, well, yeah, but if you program in a machine all that flexibility, then it will it should be able to to be as general as a human. Uh, and and that's an open question. There is this joke about uh, how we, how selfishly we uh, classify or or calculate the performance of a computer vision recognition system, and we say like, well, we put cats and dog, and then you put another animal and don't know how to classify. It's like, yeah, but if we go to a different planet tomorrow and there are aliens like the one in the movie, how do you classify them? Anthropomorphic? We call it even xenomorphs, no, or something like that, because they change. But there are shapes that we cannot recognize. But because we put the rules, we we decide on the on the machine learning. There, there, there's a big thing that I think uh, it's coming now in in the after the twenties in biology. The evo devo, no, the evolutionary development uh, has come to understand like what has created such diversity of forms in animals is to having a developmental system that allowed to explore many, many things, right? Like explore shapes, explore intelligence. Um, that's something might be missing on the artificial system, but how we do that in the artificial system, we still don't know. Yeah. Okay, so uh, going back to the, to the chat, uh, should you write, what's the follow-up to the questions posed in this paper? How has it been relevant to the hard sciences and has it changed the paradigm? Why subjects like physics are still set on the previous mentality and what types of concepts represent step ahead in the direction of embracing behavior-based methods? So, uh, yeah, the, the questions posed in the paper are still open, but they kind of guided the, the field of cybernetics. And we could say that it's still ongoing. 
uh, and it's not that they have changed physics because the classic physics don't need this type of discussions. But precisely when you want to speak about cognition, either artificial or, bi or biological, then you need to address these questions. So let's say um, it's it's something that the questions are still very current. Uh, I mean, they're they're still open. Uh, Sofia shared some work from his father. Would you like to comment on that? Um, no. <laughs> um, well, well, yeah. Um, my father works with um, the replication of DNA without enzymes, and he's he has a theory that uh, life emerged as a dissipating structure, and that DNA can uh, dissipate uh, energy in the UVC spectrum. Um, that was um, very prevalent um, near the time life started. So, so I hope you enjoy it. Yeah, thanks. Yeah, sounds interesting. <clears throat> and Domingo wrote, uh, I think the most interesting aspect that I read is this idea that decision decisions are an emergent result of a negative feedback process in a complex systems. And the weakest aspect of the article is to assume there is a purpose in scientific terms that has no support because who says what what is the purpose yeah, yeah i mean uh <clears throat> even when in science there's an eternal attempt of make, uh, to make things objective uh you can't because the moment you speak about something that's already subjective because the language we use to describe it is arbitrary uh of course it's not a problem if we agree on what language we use. So, so that's what constructivism is about. Um, so we don't have to worry about that in, in most of science, but uh, specifically in, in complex systems, you, you enter uh, into these debates because depending on the context, different definitions might be more appropriate. I mean, if we follow Wittgenstein, he would say that the, the meaning of <clears throat> words and phrases is given by the use we make of them. Uh, and uh, I, I wouldn't say that a problem, but a feature of language is that <clears throat> many of these uh, words uh, or concepts change their meaning depending on the context. Uh, I, I see it as a feature, not, not as a bug, because uh, this allows us to use um, a finite vocabulary to potentially describe an infinite uh, combination of concepts. I mean, if we created a new word for every context that we use, <coughs> then we would never finish. <laughs> uh, because let's say, if you go to a, a very large level of detail, uh, phenomena never repeat meaning that the precise configuration of atoms say in ourselves is changing constantly it never repeats so let's say just our names are a generalization of many different configurations of matter um, and the same for everything so depending on how abstract that generalization is we can have different uh, meanings for the same word and the question is not so much to find the truth uh, description of phenomena, but to agree on the description that we're using now and to be aware when these descriptions, even when they use the same label, have different meaning. Uh, yeah. Otherwise, it's an eternal source of conflict. And uh, also, what you mentioned uh, about negative feedback, um, it's, it's worth mentioning that negative feedback loops tend to minimize uh, perturbations because uh, precisely a negative feedback um, reduces the, the perturbation and uh, let's say with that it kind of maintains the system in a configuration not necessarily a stable state, it could be a stable state, but it could also be 
a dynamic state, but uh, a negative feedback preserves the, the state of a system. Whereas a positive feedback, it kind of amplifies perturbations. So you have a small perturbation and then you have positive feedback and that increases the effect of the perturbation and then another feedback would increase even more. Uh, so that will lead usually to a change of configuration of the system if you have positive feedbacks. Uh, and it is with a combination of positive and negative feedbacks that you can regulate all sorts of systems. Yeah, so I, I don't remember whether they speak about uh, positive feedback. I don't know. Yeah. Yes, sure. Yes, I have two questions related to this uh, last um, uh, the last things we talked about. So, uh, one is uh, about the, um, uh, the the talk the, the the thing that you talk about the language. So, uh, in, in the example that you made, so that uh, we have uh, many possibilities you know uh, of combining so uh, what this is what i got from the discussion that you've made uh, and this makes things purposeful i i don't know if this is the this was the 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 meaning so what i'm asking you is so the distinction be between closed closed systems and open systems is um is very important so also to uh, understand the purposefulness of uh, things. And the second question is about um, negative feedback and positive feedback. So uh, this paper talks about negative feedback and positive feedback in a very um, agile way. Yeah, I don't know how to say. Uh, so what I would like to ask is if this kind of negative feedback and positive feedback can be also interpreted in a uh, in the way that physics is intended in uh, electronics. So if, you know, it's kind of a thing that we can model upon using, uh, La, you know, Laplace's equation and so on, uh, the um, equations of stability and etc. cetera. And, uh, so if this kind of feedback is just an inspirational term or if it's mathematically um, proven to be I don't know, it can be applied also from a quantitative point of view. Yes. So, so about the difference between open and closed systems, it is very important indeed, but it also becomes arbitrary because you can have the same system and then you describe it as a closed system if you ignore <laughs> uh, what's, what's going on or uh, with, with this environment. Uh, or depending on the time scale at which you study it. So if you study it at short time scales, maybe let's say it might depend on what's going on in the environment, but maybe you can ignore it for, for your purposes. Um, but in the same system, you can say, okay, it's open and, uh, and consider what happens. And in many cases in science, we consider closed systems because um, makes them easier to handle and more predictable because if they're open it's not always possible to press to specify all the possible interactions that uh, that the system will have with its environment um, and of course you could say well i describe a uh, system and then it's open so then i describe its environment but then you could describe uh, actually, what you are doing is describing a greater system that includes the system and its environment, and that's closed. Um, because if you assume, okay, it will be open, and I don't know what might uh, come in, uh, or, or what perturbations might affect the system, uh, then you are unable to, to, to do some analytical calculations that you would, might want to do. And for that, you, you require like to have a full description of the system. So, so in some cases, you will try to have this full description of the system and environment or without environment 
uh, precisely because of that. But uh, it also depends on whether you want to have some formal proof or consider all possible situations, even when in reality that's not possible. But let's say if you are interested more about the theoretical side, um, but if you are more from an engineering perspective and pragmatic, then basically whatever works. <laughs> uh, and, and you can consider open systems and then you just try them in a bunch of different situations. And if it works in most of them, then it's good to go. And very probably later you will face an unforeseen situation and you just cross fingers that the system will keep on working. <laughs> um, and the second question about the formality of feedback. Uh, I mean, the concept is already previous, um, at least from thermodynamics. Uh, I mean, in the industrial revolution, a steam engine uh, already uh, had the, the concept of, of feedback. And, uh, but, but yeah, the, the mathematics describing feedback processes have become more sophisticated since and you can use them uh, without any problem. But actually in cybernetics, that was one of the big contributions of cybernetics to, to have a mathematical description of feedback, uh, positive and negative. So in, in Wiener's cybernetics book, a large part of it has to, has to do with feedbacks. And, uh, and later this have been used in different disciplines. So for example, uh, René Thomas uh, has a couple of papers from the early 70s where he takes um, Kaufman's model of genetic re regulatory networks that we will discuss next week, uh, random Bula networks, and uh, he studies it from the perspective of, of feedbacks and it's a derives analytically what are the implications of having feedbacks in genetic circuits. So for example, if you have, I can't remember properly, but I think if you have a positive feedback loop, then it means that you have uh, multi-stability, meaning that you can have, uh, well, he proved that if you have positive feedback loop, basically that one gene increases, switches on another gene, and then that gene and it switches another gene, and that switches on the, the first one, that will lead to multi-stability, meaning that you will have at least two attractors. Uh, so th that's just one example of things that have been done with the mathematics of feedback, let's say. So um, Mauricio writes in the chat, I had a doubt regarding Matrona's machines from his book, The Machinas y Seres Vivos. Following Rus Rosenbluth's behavior scheme, the autopoietic machine in its metabolic interactions that make self its self-concatenation possible would correspond to an active and purpose purposeless behavior. While allopoietic machines, many of them technical machines, can be better characterized uh, from higher levels in terms of prediction, uh, first, second order. Um, yeah, I mean, the, the autopoiesis model of Matrona Varela, and oh, I forgot the name of the third author of the first paper, but yeah. Um, you, you could say that, uh, I mean, it has a random element because the, the, uh, the molecules are moving randomly and then they kind of self-organize. <laughs> so it, it was, more or less in this, uh, I forget whether, whether it was the same for uh, 1943 or a bit later that Ashby published the first uh, paper where the term self-organizing system was introduced. Self-organization was al already uh, around, but not very common, but it, it was in parallel. So one could say that self-organization can help they give uh, purpose to systems that are uh, random. So then that would um, be against this classification. 
uh, and and then let's say if if you agree that the autopoietic model kind of produces a, a living cell uh, or a model of a, a living cell uh, that self maintains itself uh, then you could speak about oh yes the purpose of the cell is to survive or something like that and you could make more sophisticated models that also reproduce or something like that um but again it, it depends more on the description that you make than on the system because you could say like well where is that purpose coming from <laughs> is it inherent to the system or it's something that we use to describe it for our own purposes uh, and it's a bit of both you cannot say that it's purely objective and the purpose is there or uh, it's completely arbitrary and we decide what's purposeful or not uh, without any consideration of of the system itself uh, Lucrecia writes, the article says that predictive behavior requires the discrimination of at least two coordinates, one temporal and one spatial. What other variables or coordinates are considering higher or the predictions? They depend on the object sensors. Uh, I, I guess it's very specific to the problem domain because it, it depends on what you're trying to predict, which are the necessary variables for, for making that prediction. And also what we've learned since they, they they wrote this book is that there are different limits to prediction uh so would you consider let's say the weather forecasts uh enough prediction even when it's probabilistic or or not uh and, and then you you start having lots of gray zones in this sharp classification scheme um but <clears throat> also you, you mentioned um, so, so you mentioned that at the end, the, the idea of teleology that was used as a synonymous with purpose co controlled by, by the feedback, you say that teleology had been interpreted in the past to, to imply purpose and the vague concept of a final cause that, that comes from Aristotle. And uh, this concept of final causes has led to the opposition of teleology to the determinism. And let's say they say, okay, we, we are not going to enter the discussion of final causes, but they kind of say that, okay, uh, you can have purpose and it's deterministic and you don't have to speak about final causes and it's okay. <laughs> um, yeah, because how they define purpose there is independent of, of initial or final cause. Um, yeah. But it's actually also related to the problem of free will that is not addressed here, but it's kind of implicit in, in the series of concepts that, uh, that are dealt uh, in this paper. And um, the, the idea of free will, it uh, has been debated broadly. Uh, and there are lots of views about it and it's not settled and most probably it will never will. Um, so the, the main discussion is not that there is nothing that we can describe as free will, just whether it's real or not. <laughs> and then we can enter the discussion of what's real and what's not. But the, let's say the reductionist uh, philosophers uh, let's say who we'll assume that reality is given by physics, matter and energy, and then everything is derived from there, would say that free will, it's an epiphenomenon. It means that it seems to us that it's there because we kind of observe patterns and kind of uh, make abstractions and call that free will. But really, if you had all the information about atoms, like Laplace's demon, then you would be able to predict human behavior, and uh, and therefore free will is just an illusion. It can be a useful concept in some cases, but 
let's say if, if you had enough information, you could predict everything in the universe. Uh, that that's the, so the, that same argument about predictability applied to free will uh, kind of renders it uh, an epiphenomenon. Yes, so it's not it's, it's not real. However, uh, with the arguments that we have used against reductionism, we can also uh, argue about their not necessarily reality, but that free will has a cause on matter and energy. So, for example, I have the free will to move my hand like this or like this. And uh, if I had the full description of all the atoms of my body, I don't think that you would be able to predict that I'm going to move my hand like that because uh, that is a result of the configuration of the organization at higher scales of, of my body. And you cannot get that just with information of, um, of the atoms or molecules or subatomic particles. Uh, and anyway, it has an effect on the atoms of my hand because it moves in ways that do not violate the laws of physics, but cannot be described only with the laws of physics uh, how will my hand move? Um, because it's uh, well has also to do with our causality, which is another problematic concept for reductionists. Um, so yeah, I, I I don't know if anyone would like to to comment more about free will and how it's related. <laughs> um, whether we can speak also about free will in machines, following the same argument or not. Because uh, free will, we might discard it and say, well, yeah, only philosophers need to worry about that. Being pragmatic, we just live our lives and we don't care whether we call, whether free will is real or not. But in law, it's assumed that there is free will uh, and therefore you're responsible for your actions. If there was no free will, then we wouldn't have choice. Let's say it would be predetermined and let's say we, we will have the illusion of choice but then uh if you saw this film with tom cruise minority report then basically if you have enough information you can predict who will commit a crime uh and it's deterministic uh, uh, and then you can prevent it uh so it, it is important that, well Law assumes that there is free will and you have choice uh, whether to commit a crime or not. And if you do, then you're responsible for it. And that is why um, people with some mental conditions who are considered not to be responsible of their actions, they get less uh, years in jail, for example. Uh, this argument you just made about free will is the basis of uh, biopolitics, right? So of the mm -hmm. idea of saying that uh, humans are predictable, so uh, laws and economy will be uh, modeled around the deterministic idea of how people will behave, right? So maybe, yeah, yeah maybe what, what, what I was intending when I wrote a scale-based argument so it depends also on how many particles how many elements of the uh, system that we are considering are involved in the interaction with another system or another part of the system that has another scale so how many other elements in the scale so depending on this interaction between i don't know maybe it can be thought as a multi-layered um, system so maybe this can give us a, a tool to, to understand better the complexity. But I don't know if also multilayering is already obsolete and too redu reductionist as a, an approach. Yeah, no, actually, uh, redu reductionism kind of tries to go to the bottom layer and then assumes that all the other layers derive fully from there. 
And when we study multiple layers, we kind of under, understand that not only the bottom layers affect the higher ones, but also the higher ones affect the lower ones. Uh, so, so yeah, that's it, it is an open question because also, uh, for example, in the game of life, you you have emergent structures, but you don't let's say they don't change the basic rules, which you could call at the bottom layer. Um, those don't change. Uh, and still the emergent structures and for example, gliders and spaceships and so on, uh, you can use those to build more complex structure and not to care about the lower layer, but still the lower, lower layer is defining the dynamics. Um, so in that case, uh, it is, we could say re reductionist that there is no um, top-down causality. I mean, the, if you have a, a spaceship flowing in space, that doesn't change the rules of the cells. Um, and, and I would argue that this movement does change the rules of, of the atoms, well, the, the dynamics of, of the atoms. Um, and uh, I mean, there's this. I, I think I mentioned at the first class the, the blender thought experiment that uh, you you grab a cute animal, I don't know, a, a little duckling or an ugly duckling, uh, and you put it in a blender and you press maximum, and the molecules will be the same, but they are organized in a different way, uh, somehow reducing the cuteness level of the duckling and um, and that difference in organization is is relevant so if if you don't consider the multiple scales then uh let's say the the bottom level description is not enough okay um so Ugo? Yes. Um, so there are many things I want to comment, but to keep it simple, I'm, I'm going to build on top of that idea of, for example, of game of life, not being able to affect their underlying rules. And I think when we think about life, we can think it, it's very recur recursive. Uh, we have the first microorganisms and they gather together using kind of the same rules to build more complex systems and so on and so on and we don't we are not able to backtrack what's the origin what's the initial set of of what started this recursion and it seems that we are going in the other direction we are starting to create artificial organisms using the same rules but different materials like uh, silicon hardware and we're going, we're building the next layer of complexity. <clears throat> Internet is kind of this living thing already that has feelings and it's trying to keep itself surviving. So, so that's interesting. But also, uh, I want to talk about like, what if we could change the underlying rules? So then we become, we have, we could choose, like, basically, we have two options, like, if you take the blue pill, uh, you're going to live in a deterministic world. You can choose that. Uh, you can choose to be deterministic. But if you take the red pill, uh, then you, you have the option of living in a world where there's free will and you can even affect your existence. But there comes some dangers of doing that, right? Uh, we could destroy existence. We could destroy life or we could try to preserve it because it seems like on, on an unconscious level, we know that's our purpose, keep existing and keep playing again. That's the only purpose. And we know it, uh, a, uh, a man, a person who's unhealthy only has one wish to be healthy To And they call this like to optimize the potential number of states that that's what life is like. We want to be able to reach more states 
to keep existing because we don't know which one of the branches is going to destroy us. So we want to have as many branches as possible. Uh, but that's one strategy. Yeah, <laughs> yeah that's, that's a the strategy, right? We want diversity because that, diversity. But that, that's the strategy of put, don't put all your eggs in, in the same basket. But Mark Twain said, put all your eggs in one basket and then keep uh, guard that basket with your life. <laughs> <laughs> That's the first shot. Yeah, I mean, this is, I, I love these debates. Uh, they're very fun. I, I, I don't, I'm not, I don't study a lot, but, but I, I, I view that, that's my point of view. I think there is purpose in this life. One is keep existing. And the other one is uh, figure out a game on your own. And that's the free will. Like if you you accomplish the first goal, then you can decide the other goal. <laughs> so the, the purpose of life is to find the purpose of life? Yeah, kind of. It's like <laughs> in, keep going in a purposeless <laughs> game. <laughs> yeah. All right. Yeah, I, I pasted in the chat a link to a paper we did with with a master student and a, a postdoc uh, where we studied a model wh where you have top-down causality. So it's a bit like the game of life, but where you have higher level structures and those affect the lower level structures. And well, yeah, uh, we, we can speak about that in, in further classes. So <clears throat> going back to the chat, Jose Alberto writes, I somewhat disagree with the author's view that purposeful behavior means voluntary activity. They mention a torpedo with a target seeking mechanism as an example of intrinsic purposeful behavior, but I find it difficult to believe that a torpedo has the will to chase its target. Uh, and again, it's, it's a matter of description. So according to Schopenhauer, yes, it's the will of the torpedo. Um, and, and then perhaps the question is not so much whether uh, it is true or not, but whether it's useful to have that description or not. And uh, yeah, that, that's something to, to, to discuss. Um, Odin writes, uh, I was, as I talking about sensing the space and the need of having development to evolve. Uh, I think here a paper from Claren and Keller and the robots develop internal communication systems just by associating signals um, between they find food with success finding food um yeah th this is also similar to the talking heads experiments from the late 1990s in luke Stell's lab at the pre-university of brussels if if you search online talking heads uh but you, you will get videos of the talking heads uh <laughs> Let me search for a link for you. Yeah. Th that's another example of, um, of how a group of agents can self-organize to share uh, uh, vocabulary and, and meaning. Um, Should you write a scale based argument could be made about the free will discussion? Yes. Mari writes, uh, Can other living beings, plants, for example, have free will? These kind of questions are pretty related with consciousness. Maybe some approaches like the integrated information theory can help us um, to the, the, this inquiry. Um, so th there is. <clears throat> few but interesting research on plant cognition and also on social plant cognition. So for example, um, the people who study this say that it's not that plants don't have cognition, just that it's not the same as in animals where we have dedicated sensors and actuators. So you can see, oh, this animal has eyes and paws and uh, then they can, brains and, and things like that and in plants all of these are distributed so they do have sensors but they don't have a central nervous system 
they don't have uh, yeah everything works at the chemical level rather than at an organ level uh well not everything but ma many things uh so so they communicate with chemical signals through the roots and through the air uh so there are some plants that uh if, if one plant detects a plague then it releases a chemical and neighboring plants kind of uh release chemical that defends them from from that plague uh and also uh there's some recent work on how there's exchange of gases through the root systems of trees of different species um that kind of allows the saplings to grow uh, healthy so that's why many reforestation projects fail because they assume that you just plant a, a little tree and it will grow uh but it, they need fungi they need uh, worms they need big trees to protect them and to exchange uh nutrients and um and yeah, th this is not considered, and, and that's why many programs that can plant millions of trees lead to failure. Um, and and uh, perhaps what is more interesting about plants is that all their cells have an electric potential, meaning that all the plant cells can function as neurons. So that's why we don't think that they're smart because we don't see a central nervous system, but all their cells are processing information or can process information in a similar way as, as neurons. Uh, so it's, it's something that it's only beginning to be studied. Um, yeah. Because yeah, the, it would be, the, there's also this question like, okay, if we uh, encounter some alien life forms that are very different and have very different sensors from ours, meaning they don't have eyes, they don't have uh, extremities. Uh, they, they would interact very differently with their environment. Uh, yeah, how, how can we understand them or how do they understand the world? Uh, I don't know, imagine very sophisticated clams or something. Uh, okay. Uh, should she ask whether someone was referring to the research of 